Welcome to Center for Social Change. Today I get to host the founder, the rock star that built this. Bill Burdett is in for a dream. He's, he's rocking lives, he's changing lives. He helped create and found the Center for Social Change in Miami and a few more across the country to impact people's lives, help nonprofits create a tech hub that now they can go build relationships within the community and um, raise grants and understand how the system works so they can really can get better results than if they're all over the place. So thank you for coming today. Good. You know, I like to consider our center to be like a social laboratory because we deal with a lot of charities, about 350 charities nationwide. And our primary, my primary objective is to figure out what works. And we particularly look for something called an inflection point. In other words, so that if you're sort of traveling along and all of a sudden you have this potential that you can grow significantly, you know, like 50, 100, 200 percent, that's what we're looking for. And so to the extent that, that we find that, that's what we try and focus on. In other words, we don't focus on all of the 350 charities. We try to help them out little by little, but part of what we're helping them out with is to analyze what's the potential. <clears throat> the, the biggest one that we've sort of dealt with is called Educate Tomorrow. And to just give you sort of some an overview of that, they're one of the most successful foster care agencies in, the, in Florida and maybe in the whole United States. And the reason is that they really sort of wrap around services like mentoring and everything for kids getting out of high school and going to college. Because in the state of Florida, every foster care kid has the right to go to, co to, to college for free. And they get, yeah, actually support them, in other words, the stipend that they get. But not all of the foster care kids know about it. And to the extent that they may know about it, they're not necessarily mentored early enough. In other words, you can't just sort of plop out of high school and then all of a sudden, oh, hey, but where's, where's my tuition? And think it's going to work. No, you've got to sort of prepare for it. You've got to know what it is that you've got to do to be ready for college. And to the extent that, that that's what the mentoring does, then that's what Educate Tomorrow does. Now, statistics across the United States, only 4% of the kids across the United States that are coming out of, that age out of foster care, get into and through college. 4%. 70% in five years are either incarcerated, addicted, or teenage pregnancy. That's not the right formula for figuring out how to deal with your life. 40% of the people going through Educate Tomorrow are getting into and completely through college. So that's a huge difference. <laughs> We've basically worked with <clears throat> Educate Tomorrow for the last two, three years to expand their program outside of Florida. And we've currently got a very strong program in Colorado. We've got a developing program in, in Texas, and we've got a developing program at a college in, in California. So we're now touching, they're now touching three other states that they had never been in before. And to the extent that that's taking that particular organization finding an inflection point and then ramping up that's what we're trying to do and they're getting substantial grants this year we hope uh to to continue to sort of grow that process throughout the united states yeah brett the ceo over there with his wife they are a rock star team and i've yep. known them for a few years mm -hmm. it's interesting how they are um, linked to you guys because there's so many foundations that come through here mm -hmm. and they grow and at some point they might go get other offices and grow out of right. here but they'll stay attached because they right. understand the value mm -hmm. and I find that when I was growing up in California or uh, when I was in Texas or Arizona or you know in DC you know New York they don't have like I never found a center like this. I didn't understand like that a nest, right? Where they can grow out of. Yeah, because right. even you and your staff, Valerie or you know whoever else, will shoot me an email and say, "Hey, I want to introduce you to so and so. Right. You got to meet them." And so right. what's interesting is is that people talk here, and it's like this family that's created. Mm -hmm. That's it's like nowhere else that I've ever. And I travel a ton. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, people mm -hmm. see my travel schedule. I've never found anything like the Center for mm -hmm. Social Change. So. When I first saw it, you walk in, it's this 
like there's chairs and there's it's like a tech innovation hub. Right, right. There's these conference rooms and there's these there's everything you would want and the ability to have meetings and presentations and mm-hmm. trainings and mm-hmm. whatever you need. And then you guys come on with all these other resources. Mm-hmm. Where do you see, like, how did this whole start? Like, what was your, like, did you, like, have a dream one night? Did you just wake up one day? You were like, I know what I'm going to do. Like, how did this all start? Well, in a, in a way, it's an offshoot of the main business that we have, which is dealing with community banks. In other words, we place deposits. It's, it's a business called Network Administrator. You're dis- distributing deposits to community banks. Now, if you're a community bank, what's the main thing that you want? Because there are 6,000 community banks in the United States. We only deal with about a couple hundred of them. And so we want to continue to grow that business because it pays for all this rent and everything. And at the end of the day, those banks want to figure out exactly what you just said. In other words, they want to figure out how do they grow their community, how do they make it sound, how do they make it safe, how do they make sure that there's good health care and good housing and, and, and support for their community? Now, at that scale, it's obviously very sort of catch as catch can because of the fact that there's nobody, like you said, there's nobody doing what we do. And so we serve sort of like a library of examples that enables them to do more. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to use our base business, which is dealing with a business environment, community banks, that have to wake up in the morning caring about their community. And so we say, hey, how about this? How about that? You know, let's try and organize it in such a way. All of our accounts are set up at the community bank level in the name of a local charity. That's why we've got so many charities, because we've got the accounts and we're just setting them up in such a way that it says, hey, bank, here's a cool charity. Or they tell us, you know, okay, you found one, let me find two or three more. We've got one bank, and, and Dallas has got eight charities now that they're supporting you know, through our process and everything. So it's that combination. In other words, that's the way the whole thing started because we wanted to link the two. We wanted to link our interest in doing the community support. Now, the center itself really sort of grew organically. In other words, we only had a little piece of the, the office several years ago, I guess maybe about uh, six years ago. And the person that was subletting to us left. So the whole floor was like get it open. All. But, but we didn't think we could really handle more than like half of it. So we built out half of it. And like within a few, few months, that was all used up. So said, oh, okay, we'll take the rest of the half. And so then we had the whole second floor. And then we had more people that wanted to join us. So, so we signed up for the fifth floor. And it took us almost literally a year to figure out how to actually build that out and everything. Mm -hmm. And so in the meantime, we took a part of the sixth floor for the people who wanted to come in. And and, but we kept growing. It was was just sort of an organic growth process. So it was just a little bit. There wasn't sort of a master plan. It was just let's try and do something. I love it. So what's the goal? Like you have this whole place is packed every day now. I come here and everybody. There's some of the most amazing people that are. Not just trying to make impact, but how you guys structure the different nonprofits, help each other structure outcomes and results, mm-hmm. and everybody grows here. If you can't grow here, right. you don't have the growth mindset to grow anywhere, Right. from my perspective. And interestingly enough, I think that we attract people <clears throat> who want to be here because they want to grow. Yep. So at the end of the day, it's not like we have to teach them that. I mean, yes, we have workshops and, you know, you know, you've, you've met our, our, you know, fundraising side, you know, the grant uh, side, Grants Inc. But at the end of the day, that process is more what I call bumping into each other. In other words, there have been times, you, you know, motivational edge, you know, I mean, they came in literally from the point of view that you're saying, I want to, I want to space here so that we can sort of figure out how to grow. They didn't even pay their, their rent. I shouldn't say that too loud. <laughs> for their, but, but that was the agreement. There was that we would sponsor them for this or first six months so that they can just get their feet wet. And they didn't have anything at that point. Right, exactly. Got it. And to the extent that you take a project like that and give them sort of like a display capability, look how wonderful I look, look how organized I look. You, you know Ian, he's very organized. Yeah. So at the end of the day, he starts to look bigger so that he can then look to expand and now when he first came in here he had one location 
now in the state of Florida. Now he's basically expanding to seven locations in the state of Florida. And he's got the potential through the uh, NFL groups that he's talking to, to expand to other cities. So it's like <laughs> that, that whole process is growing organically. We didn't tell them to do that. We didn't sort of give them a strategic plan and it, 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 you know, it, it, no, it kind of just grew because of the fact that once he got some spirit behind him, once he got sort of like some wind under his wings, it just took off, you know, and he's doing a good job with that. So why this though? Like I understand you love to make impact, but you can do it a million different ways. Well, in a way, that's part of the social laboratory thing. In other words, let's just take your statement as it's, you stated it. You could do it a million ways. Now, clearly, one person or even a whole bunch of people in an office can't do a million. So what would you want to do to make it more effective? You'd figure out, okay, of the million ways that I could have done it, what's the one or two or three or five that would really have a big impact? That's where you get to the laboratory aspect because you start studying what it is that works and what doesn't work. I think I've shared with you the Wilkinson Report. It's a TED Talk where this, this uh, healthcare administrator in England had done a 10-year study on all of the different aspects of health of a society worldwide. In other words, it wasn't just England, it wasn't just the United States, it wasn't just West, you know, Western nations, it was all over the world. And they found that there was almost a direct correlation between economic inequality and 11 social dysfunctions. In other words, you could take any one of those dysfunctions. It's, it's homicides, incarceration, it's teenage pregnancies, it's child mortality, it's drug addiction. All of these, these social dysfunctions, in other words, something's not working, something's getting out of, all connected to economic inequality. In other words, it's teaching you, again, going back to what are the million things you're going to work on, what do you need to realize is causing this? Mm. I use the analogy to that game whack-a-mole, you know, where the kids sort of sit there and they, they have a mallet and they hit, you know, one and yeah. it comes up someplace else. That's, that's the, the concept of dealing with symptoms. In other words, it's sort of like saying that you've got a cold, but you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to drink orange juice or, or worse yet, you know, orange, you know, like, like a, a, a diet soda or something. In other words, you don't realize what's really causing the problem. In other words, you, you whatever, but bottom line is that you're dealing with a symptom. Yeah. You're not dealing with the cause. Yeah, yeah. And so in that concept, we're trying to find out more and more what the cause is so that you can figure, you know, the, the, the analogy, they, they talk about going upstream. Back in the days when we had many, many, many rivers that were polluted, they spent a lot of time and money fixing the river, not realizing that it was upriver that people were dumping the stuff. And so if you don't go upriver, they did this in the Hudson River. I don't think I was familiar with it. It's a very famous, I think it was Pete Singer, uh, had the brilliant idea. He lived in Westchester, and he had the brilliant idea. Let's go upriver and figure out who's causing this problem. Yes, it's bad in, in the Hudson and around Manhattan and everything, but who's causing it? It's not caused in Manhattan. So why should we be spending all this money cleaning it up in the Manhattan area when it's the people upstream that are causing the problem? Yep. And they figured out who it was and they shut them down and basically then it wasn't a problem anymore. So that's what we've kind of keep doing. So I'll throw another analogy. I think that people mm -hmm. understand. I love this, that mm -hmm. you're going here. Uh, so many people are, let's say, allergic to something. Right. And I look at them, I go, why are you allergic? They're like, oh, it just doesn't work with my body. And I'm like, well, actually, it's your immune system. Mm -hmm. Isn't strong enough. So let's go to gut health mm -hmm. that can create better immune. Right. So let's go to the real, like, foundation of what's going on Perfect and they're like example. they have no clue people are like oh i'm just allergic and i'm like no you're not just uh, humans just aren't all alert like what? okay i guess if you eat like wall right or, <laughs> right, or right. chair or table or whatever okay maybe you might not digest so well mm -hmm. but it's just so interesting that we've created the system that people are like i just won't eat that instead of going huh Let's go back to like personal, right. super deep health and right. figure out what's not healthy right. in our body. Okay, but take it one step further because the, the example you just gave is a perfect one for what is usually offered is again a system, a, a, a symptom related thing. The drug industry, 
will give that person something that, that takes care of the problem right now, the system. The, the sim, sim, a pill, right? Right, a pill. Yeah. Something that will basically, okay, I don't have indigestion anymore because of the allergic <laughs> reaction. I didn't, don't have you know, the spots on my hands anymore because of the, but But it doesn't solve the problem. What but the spots are on my face now. They're not on my hands, they're on my face. <laughs> okay, but, but the, the point is that it goes beyond just nudging the person yeah. to get to the real symptom, you know, the, the real cause of that problem, it's making sure that you're not wasting resources in the whole society just playing with the symptom. I totally. So I understand building out nonprofits, helping them look and feel how they should because I find a lot of nonprofits have, the, the executive direction and staff have huge, huge hearts mm -hmm. and they have huge purposes in their life and they want to go impact lives. How, um, like, did you go through certain challenges? Did you have a certain group of people, maybe your parents or mentors, help you build in your purpose, like really connect to yourself? You have a huge growth mindset. You have a lot of books that you read. Like, how did you start finding your way? Sort of like the laboratory concept. I, I treated myself as a laboratory, you know, so that I just would try this, try this, try this. I mean, I am rabid about trying stuff. I mean, I get kidded because of the fact that somebody will mention something, you know, about a particular program and literally, as they're sitting there conversing with me, I'm either ordering the book about it or I'm arranging an interview with the person if they're local or getting together with a psychologist to test it out. In other words, what is the, the, the process that you're using here? Does it really work the way that they say on YouTube, etc.? or I'll go to YouTube and listen to a, a bunch of uh, YouTube videos that are describing it. So that laboratory concept is really what the main thing is. I mean, I've, I've, I've tried, there, there's such a broad scope of what we're working on that it becomes very difficult to find a mentor because I'm not dealing with one area. Mm. I'm dealing with a whole range of areas. And, and unfortunately, in this day and age, go back to the symptom concept, we've got a lot of specialists. Specialists don't help you. Yeah. Because they're committed to their way. That's that, hey, I've spent my whole life, you know, all this time learning that specialty. Am I going to now admit that I'm only dealing with a symptom? Yeah. And that I can't really sort of understand or haven't spent the time because it would take me another 20, 30 years to actually get into the cause rather than the symptom. Yeah. They're not going to do that. And I, and I don't even really want to convince them or to, to criticize them for being at that level. It's just that, in essence, somebody's got to play sort of, you know, an advocate for searching for the real answer, not the simple answer or the pharmaceutical answer or you know just the even an academic answer because the academics tend to sort of gloss things over economics is a perfect example of that you know the academics are sitting there with with their methods and mathematical formulas that every one of them will admit to you is wrong because it's based on a perfect model of how the economy in essence is self-regulating and I think that all of us waking up in the morning know that A, you're dealing with human beings, so it's not mathematical, it's not predictable, and it doesn't man manage itself. Excuse me, we just had a real meltdown, the, the Great Recession or whatever. That's not self-regulating. That, that was a bitch. That was very difficult. So it's those realms, in other words, our knowledge workers, are really de still dealing with a lot of symptoms and they're not spending enough time to really understand the cause. Hmm. I agree with you. So where is the future of this? Where, where Obviously, you guys are in a few different states right now. Mm -hmm. You want to grow a couple hundred you know, plus nonprofits. Where do you see this kind of innovation because I see it with the for profits where they mm -hmm. get funders and you know they're you know really impacting but I don't see it with what you guys are because I think a lot of time the nonprofits just don't have the money. Like you guys are funding a chunk of this. Right. And right. long time long term you're providing so much that obviously you're gonna grow and you're gonna get bigger funders and, mm -hmm. and you guys are gonna be able to grow and support mm -hmm. more but and nonprofits will be able to support you too back. Mm -hmm. You know, where do you see this? Like in five years, ten years? I watched a workshop 
so, you know, somebody who was sort of a answer, trying to answer the question you were asking, and they called it the fourth sector. In other words, if you stop and think of it, and, and I came from a sector, investment banking, that's where my background was, that was serving the, the for-profit business world. So if you think you've got basically a for-profit business world, you've got a non-for-profit world. You've got services, Wall Street, accounting firms, PR, marketing, that serve the for-profit. There needs to be a more robust fourth segment, fourth sector, that basically is almost literally like a um, investment banker for firms, you know, for nonprofits. Hmm. Look at what we did for Educate Tomorrow. Look what we're doing for Motivational Edge. Those kind of things are what an investment banking firm would do for a for-profit. We need more of those kinds of conceptual people, in other words, people who basically have skills as an accountant, as an investment banker. You probably met Silvio, you know, I mean, he's an investment banker who's mm -hmm. doing for, you know, good things for sort of social impact types of deals. And we're doing currently a uh, underwriting, working with the people who set up a underwriting for uh, African American business development and everything. And we're working with them because that, again, is a model for how do you use the for-profit access to funding to really address a social impact objective. The name of the, the offering is social, inve social investment holdings. I mean, they're very clear about what they're trying to do. In other words, they're not trying to hide it, you know, underneath, you know, okay, I'm going to make a lot of money, but I'm going to give away a little bit of it. No, they're, they're, they're specifically targeting opportunities that are going to develop minority businesses. Hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's developing a sector that over time will continue to grow, sort of like Wall Street crew. But we've just got to do it, you know, in, in, in a way that's consistent and attracts other people to it. Otherwise, you, they begin to see. Now, just so that you sort of expand the concept of what's in that, that fourth sector, it's systems-oriented people. Because I keep talking about, you know, what's the difference between the symptom and the cause. In essence, the cause is embedded in a system. Hmm. And, and there are organizations, the next system, you know, corp, and in other words, there are groups in the United States that are specifically doing the analysis in much deeper, you know, much more, you know, sort of resource or oriented fashions to find out what's wrong with the system. Mm -hmm. You know, and let, let me just give you some statistics in Dade County. The United Way in 11 states in the United States, and I don't know why they stop with that, maybe it's just funding have done an analysis of the degree to which the population can live within the economic realm of where they're, they're located, like Dade County. You know, can you break even in Dade County if you're a low-income person? That's what they call an ALICE score, A-L-I-C-E. And they, that stands for Asset Limited, where they've probably got no more than $100 in the bank, if they have a bank account. Income constrained, A L I C, income constrained, which means they're, they're sort of the working poor. Maybe you don't have two or three jobs and still don't have enough money. E, employed. So they've employed, in other words, nobody can bash them around for being, you know, living off of the, the, the government or this. No, they're employed, they're trying to do it, but they can't make enough to break even hmm. in that city. 61% of the households in Dade County cannot break even. 61%, 47% statewide cannot break even. That is a systemic problem. Yeah. That is not their fault. You're not structuring. When you have a minimum wage of seven and a quarter or whatever it is for 15 years, excuse me, you're pushing them into poverty. I mean, what is a person going to do? You know, the corporation, is they going to pay them more just because, you know, they feel good today? No. If they can get away with seven and a quarter, they're going to get away with it. And you're forcing them to do that. I think our upcoming generation, too, just looking at the workforce development, mm -hmm. different locations, and some of the kids going through our high school and <clears throat> the kids we've taught at, at a college, mm -hmm. they're not worth $10. Right. Like it's crazy, like the interim jobs, right? Mm -hmm. I just heard this article, and it's interesting because I, I agree with you. I, I, we need to be able to. I believe if you, if I go into a company today, if I went into McDonald's 
And I said, awesome, I'll take seven or eight dollars, nine dollars, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. In 30, 60 days, I would be an assistant manager because of work ethic or whatever time period, right? I'd be super fast. But I also know how to operate. I know how to show up. I know how to take notes. I know how to follow through. The toilets would be the cleanest toilets I've ever seen. I would train five other people to love cleaning the toilets. The place would be immaculate. Like, I know how to structure it, but I've been through a lot like you. Like, not as much as you, but I understand how to build a company and how to process and create outcomes and goals and everything else. And I think we're not teaching our kids the basic essentials to make them worth because you know to pay ten dollars an hour, they have to make the company thirty because mm-hmm. they have taxes, which are a third right. of it, right? And then they have some income that they need for profit margins and everything. So it's interesting and hard costs, right? On that, mm-hmm. so it's very interesting to be able to see what I think we're doing. And I agree that we should be able to prepare our kids to make fifty bucks an hour, you know, right. as minimum wage. You know, I mean, it, okay. But just to, to sort of take you back in history, yeah. It used to be when we had stronger unions in the United States, especially in the auto industry that a kid could come out of high school knowing nothing about what you just described in yeah. terms of work ethic and this, that, and the other thing. But let's just say that their father was working there and so that they could get a job, but an entry-level job, yeah. $20 an hour. Totally. 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and that was a ton, ton of money. The person could get married, they could get a house, they could get a car, they could live and not be stressed. Yeah. Today, doesn't exist. And they're in debt from college. Right. Like hundred thousand, fifty thousand. I think right. the average is like thirty to fifty, something like that, right. in debt now. Right. I mean, thirty thousand dollars in debt for somebody who's making thirty, forty grand a year. You're in debt the rest of your life. Right. And, and go back to the system language. That's intentional. Oh, hundred percent. We we've got a government slash banking. business banking where they dominate us. Yep. They they want more people in essence slave wage environment. They want them enslaved by the loans. No other Western country in the world, in other words, of major Western countries, yeah. requires that the people pay their, their education expense, even even at the college level. Yeah. This is just ridiculous. We do it not because it's good. There was who 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 out there is gonna raise their hand. I think we should have a system where you have to pay yourself for the cost of your education. Yeah. Excuse me. It's crazy. You know, you're not going to have a good, healthy environment for people to live within if you do it that way. Yeah. So why do you do it? Because the the, the lenders want the money. Yeah. They want to scam it off. You know. And that's where I think that what you guys are doing at Center for Social Change is building nonprofits, building community. So that the community can be more prepared, they can have right. the resources, they can have whether some organizations here are how to do a grant or banking or, I mean, it's all over the place right. on really impacting foster care. We're doing DJJ stuff in schools. I mean, right. they're all over the place to really impact and give sustainable models. Right. Not just, oh, let's go get a grant. And then, oh, in a couple of years, we're not funded you know, anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's really, I, I love, not only do you bring people together, but these problems that we're having on a mass scale, you guys are actually putting solution-based projects into play. Trying to find them. <laughs> but, but, you're, but you're doing right, it good. Right, I mean, right. you've got 80 nonprofits here. Right, I mean, right. You're building, right? right. And, and it takes somebody like a visionary like you to really understand what's needed and then you bring on the right staff. Right. What's the next, what's the next things that you're going after? Maybe people on this podcast, they'll say, hey, I have that resource or, oh yeah, I love what you guys are about, about solving real big problems in life. What are you guys looking for? Bigger building, you're thinking about maybe building sometime? Yes, I mean, we're, that is one of the things that we're doing because we've got maybe three and a half years left on, on the lease here, but the idea would be to expand so that we've got a bigger base because we, we really aren't even close to breaking even. Somebody once analyzed you have to have nine floors of, of organization you know, in order to be able to break even. We've only got two and a half. Wow. So we, <clears throat> we, we should be expanding. And there are examples, not exactly like ours, but there's one in California, Magnolia Place, I think is what it's called, where they have a lot of government services that are in the building. In other words, we could build something. Let's let's say that's you know two, three, you know times the size of ours, but have government agencies in the space. 
So that way, when we need educational resources, health resources, you know, then they're right there with yep. you. They're not down the street or across the road or, you know, a long way away. And so when the person who needs the service comes in, they don't have to spend three, three days finding what they need. So that's the concept that we're sort of looking at as a possibility to grow into to have our own building. I love the one-stop shop concept because right. they can really, people that don't have a resource have to take the bus a lot of the time. Right. Or their car breaks down or whatever right. they need. So I really love that. Um, what's your guys' website so they can go and find you, they can look you up? www.4socialchange.org. Now the four is the number four. So it's www.4socialchange.org. Hey you guys, Bill is a rock star. If you are a nonprofit, if you want to impact people's lives, if you want to volunteer with a nonprofit, check out forsocialchange.org. Come in here, check out what they do, invite your friends to look at what's possible because I believe that when you see what's possible, you guys will want to be involved. Whether it's your time, it's your talent, it's your treasure, put it where you know sustainable, impacting, long-term change is happening and that's here at center for social change thanks for having me at your place thank you appreciate you brother yep see you guys have a great day